Investments that generate long-term outperformance require patience and conviction. The more dissimilar the investment or the active share measure, as our ETF advisors know, the more diligence and understanding it may require. In this ETF think tank exchange, we'll explore the Davis approach to investment decision making for the long term and the importance they place on aligning their incentives with yours with the goal of earning an investor's trust. Our special guest is Chris Davis. He's the chairman of Davis Advisors and a portfolio manager over several of their strategies. Our second guest is Mark Swido, a managing director with UBS Advisors and someone who's familiar with the Davis investment philosophy as well as their investment thinking. We especially want to thank Davis Advisors for sponsoring today's discussion because it's our sponsors who provide opportunities for ETF think tank advisors to learn how to be better investment decision makers and to help grow your practice. So now let's listen into what our guests bring to the table in today's conversation. So Chris Davis, thank you for being a part of the ETF think tank. And Mark Suito, also thank you for joining us here. Chris Davis is of Davis Advisors, um, which has been around since 1969. And I think you're frankly a, a credit to your grandfather who established the company and, and um, you know, created a great culture at that firm. Uh, I'm always amazed um, as an investor in um, some of your solutions, as I like to call them, you know, how you've built this wonderful culture at the at the firm to think long term, right? Um, we, we all are so um, subject to short term thinking. And ultimately, I think that leads to mistakes. So what I would like to jump into as a first question is how do you create a culture that is thinking long term and 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 you know communicate to the folks at your firm and then you know keep it going beyond that um for for investors well dan it, it's a great question and it's an unusual question and yet it's so central to our thinking you know as if you think first rather than think about our firm if you think about the sort of businesses that we want to invest in so when we're doing research as analysts, as portfolio managers, we're studying businesses, we're thinking about buying and owning that business in perpetuity. So we're looking and calculating the value of that business as if we bought the whole thing and the earnings and cash that it generates becomes our return. In the same way, if you bought a piece of commercial real estate for $100 million and, and it was generating you know, $8 million a year of profits, you'd think of an 8% return if that grew to 12 million, 15, and so on. So when we think about that long-term time horizon as investors, we think a lot about culture because as investors in public equities, we're delegating to management the decisions about reinvesting capital. Uh, and so we're looking for people that have a, a partnership mindset with their shareholders. And if they start taking short-term routes, that will end up hurting uh, uh, short-term shortcuts. You know, that will end up hurting us in the long-term. So similarly with our firm, we have this mindset of how do we, if we want to build generational wealth, how do we build a culture that has that orientation? And just like with public companies that we invest in, we start with incentives, right? We want to be owner operators. We want to invest in owner operators. We want to be owner operators. And that doesn't mean owning the management company. It means investing in the funds alongside our clients. And that is, I think, the most important difference in our mindset. If we have you know, over $2 billion dollars our family, our employees invested alongside our clients in the funds, it means we do a lot better from 10% better performance than 10% more assets under management. And therefore, when we make investment decisions, we're really thinking about the investment return rather than the, the marketing pitch. And I think that helps maintain if we have all of the incentives aligned towards long-term investment results instead of what uh, short-term investment fads or what might sell or appeal uh, uh, to, to the market at any given time. I think that's a big determinant. And, and of course, the, the last thing I'd say about it is, you know, really having the luxury to be able to choose your colleagues. Uh, you know, it's a huge 
uh, advantage in life to admire the people you work with. And so we know when we go through our performance cycle, we're just coming into it. We do it each year. Uh, the first criteria we evaluate every member of the team on is culture. Second is contribution. Third is ability. And so we start with that idea. Are these people that we would trust with our own uh, assets, because of course that's what we're doing when we have a member of the investment team join us. So that trustworthiness, that integrity, that work ethic, that passion, the competitiveness, all of those things, we wanna be part of our culture. Very and a nice, lot of, Chris. Well, and a lot, well, of those, a lot of those folks have been with you for 15, 20, 25 years. Yeah, I think our average uh, tenure on the team is something like 18 years. Uh, which is an amazing thing. We, I think the average industry experience is about 22 years. And uh, it is an amazing thing to to admire and really uh, care about the people you work with is, is a great luxury. When Whenever people are starting out in career and they're looking for career advice, I always remind them of the old saying, people don't quit their job, they quit their boss. And when you're in college, the favorite courses you took were not determined by subject. They were determined by the professor. You know, people could look back on their life and say, God, I, I, I loved chemistry and I hated biology. And I promise you, it wasn't the subject matter that made you love it. It was the, it was the professor. And so I always said to my kids when they were in college, ask your friends uh, who their favorite professor was and take that course, whatever subject it is. Uh, and I, I think that's very true about a work environment, especially when you're in a professional firm. I mean, you think about UBS, you think about your firm. I mean, when you're in a professional firm, you really, you're providing a service to a client. The asset is not something that's on a balance sheet. The asset is something that goes up and down in, in the elevator. And so, you know, the firms over time are determined by the quality of people. And if you end up with a bunch of mercenaries uh, versus patriots, uh, it's not a durable business model. And, and so I feel that is, is one of the great advantages. Um, a couple of thoughts. So uh, let's start with um, culture at Davis Funds. And it's not necessarily because Chris is on here. It is the focus of our conversation today. But Chris and his firm stick out in a positive way. Being distinctively different cannot be always positive, but it is in this case. And what I lead with when I am positioning the Davis port into our Davis funds into our portfolio with our clients is the unique difference of they've got skin in the game. You know, there are some very worthy competitors of Davis that win uh, positions and slots in our portfolios. But I can't say that, you know, the biggest fund out there has, the family has is third generation running. It. I can't say that they have a large percentage of their assets that are in the same positions side by side with me. And I didn't think about it until Chris said just a minute ago, the culture there is it's better to have a 10% return than 10% more assets. And the math certainly works better uh, if you have that kind of, those kind of funds in there. So that's a very positive, distinct difference uh, in Davis funds. And Davis, what I've seen, and Chris just reiterated that, there are more buyers than renters of, of, of stocks. Now, we have special situations in our portfolio that we carve out. It could be as little as three to 5%, as much as 15, that we're more of a renter of some names, but the core of our portfolios and the nucleus are positions that we have with managers like the Davis Fund and their culture. You know, I wanna pick up on one thing that's interesting because the other, anomaly is that if you were to get a group of investment managers together and say, I'll give you two different scenarios. Scenario one is the market compounds at 15% and you compound at 14%. And scenario two is the market compounds at 2% and you compound at 3%. A lot of investment managers would choose the second one because they'd say with that relative outperformance, I can really grow my firm. No client on earth would choose the second one, right? They would all say, we would much rather grow 14% even if we're under the market. So I also think there's this second anomaly that you get when people are investing somebody else's money is they only think about the relative game and they forget that the real client aspiration is building wealth over a long period of time in order to accomplish some goal. 
that's an absolute goal, not a relative goal, right? They can't pay for their retirement with relative results. They need absolute wealth building. And I think that also keeps us a little bit out of the short-term game, but I'm really grateful for what you say, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Let me just, uh, on the heels of that, tell you guys a 60 second or less story that I'll never forget. I was in New York, it was 15 plus years ago. I happened to be one of the rooms where truly everybody was smarter than me and I knew I was in the right room and a billionaire gets up in front of everybody who has his own group of funds. And he said, relative is a fool's game and here's why. He goes, I once had, before I started my own firm, someone managing our money who came in and said, hey, great news. The markets are down eight and you're only down five. And I've responded to, and this was the gentleman saying this, so what you're telling me is you're losing your, my money slower than everybody else. <laughs> Relative performance works great and is the topic of conversation. As Chris said, when markets are up 15 and they waggle their finger at you and say, you're only up 14. But when it's down eight, they don't want to hear that you're only down X. Yeah. I, I think that's spot on. And let's, let's, you know, be honest about something, right? You know, if you just want the S&P 500 return, it costs you nothing. And there's no added value in doing that by a financial advisor. So switching um, a little bit, um, you know, Chris, you did something early that was maybe perhaps a little controversial, which was launching ETFs, right? With, with your, and they're fully transparent. You know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce this question back and forth between the two of you. You know, how did you reach that conclusion? What were the benefits, you know, to the firm in doing that? And then, you know, Mark, you know, are you looking at both ETFs as well as mutual funds? So, Chris, you go first. All right. Well, you know, like most great great ideas in any business, it it started with listening to to our advisors. Right, So we built our firm over 50 years in partnership with advisors because we feel that managing a client is different than managing a portfolio. It takes a different skill set. It takes a different personality type. Uh, it takes a different level of patience. Uh, uh, and so we've always felt that in partnership with advisors, we're dealing with professionals. We speak the same language. And then advisors are in a sense dealing with how do they manage the client behavior? How do they uh, uh, tamp down the greed in bull markets and stop them from wanting to pile into the hot dot-com stocks in 99 or some of the hot ones today? They have to tamp down greed. And then they also have to, to be cur give courage and fortitude when clients are terrified, right? So behavior modification is the most central part of the value that an advisor adds. And it's one of the reasons that I don't worry as much about things like robo-advising. I feel like so much of it is based on that ability to connect, to build trust, and to modify the behavior to stop. You know, the rule number one in a business is, hey, give the customer what he wants. Give, her, give the customer what she wants. In, in a profession, it's you're, you, you are providing a service to a client and you sometimes are telling the client exactly what they don't want to hear. In fact, if, if I go to my doctor and my doctor tells me what I want to hear, he's going to say, oh, drink as much as you want. Yeah, don't worry about the exercising, you know. Uh, but of course, the doctor is a professional. So they have to tell me things that I don't always want to hear. They have to try to modify my behavior. That's the nature of the advisor portfolio manager relationship. And so we had a bunch of advisors come to us and say, hey, you know, ETFs really are helpful uh, for a lot of my clients. Uh, they're helpful. I love the ease of transactions. I love the transparency. I like some of the tax efficiency in different environments. And, and could you guys uh, offer your services as an ETF? And my first reaction was, I, I thought that was just for indexes. Well, if you look through at the indexes, there are a lot of indexes that have higher turnover than we have, right? In other words, we have an investment style that is particularly suited to an actively managed ETF because we are by and large, large cap. We have relatively low turnover. We have relatively low fees and expenses. So we don't have to worry about fee arbitrage. And we have a culture of transparency because we built our practice with advisors 
we want advisors to know what we own so that they can ask questions. So they can look through and say, hey, I'm, I'm nervous about this name or tell me how this worked out the way that it did. So we've had a culture of transparency for 50 years. And so as we looked into it, we said, well, we're, we're gonna offer these up. We offered our core uh, uh, services, the areas of the market where we felt the most excited. Uh, we put our own money into those ETFs and then we expected everybody to follow. And instead there were sort of crickets. Uh, time went by months, years, and nobody else, no true sort of long-term proven active managers were offering fully transparent uh, traditional ETFs. And, and uh, we were surprised, but now after four or five years, it does seem now like that uh, others are moving that way. And, and we're gratified by that because we think it's actually good for the category of ETFs to have real active management in there. And some of the firms coming in are firms that we do admire. And so we think that's very legitimizing for the category. Mark? You know, uh, let's think how I could start this. It's like someone says, do you like value or growth? And I say, yes. <laughs> you know, you want the crack crab or the lobster, take both. Uh, with Davis um, as an example, true confessional, we back sort of fell back, you know, backwards into the ETFs. And how did we do that? Well, you know, with mutual fund accounting, that if there are distributions, you can make money in a fund yet have a tax loss. And so we didn't want to exit Davis uh, for even um, a wash sale, you know, during the 31 day wash sale period. And uh, our, you know, the, the gentleman that covers us through Davis says, well, let me introduce you to ETFs. This was, I don't know how many years ago, but it was. And so we said, okay. And we looked at the, the two of them side by side. And um, that's how we really started into the Davis ETFs. It was just because of, of, of tax consequences. And Chris and the Davis funds, I don't want to paint a picture that have lost money. They've made us a, a tremendous amount of money through times, but sometimes taxes you know, can drive in a short period of time. So that's how we got into the ETFs. There was a misnomer when I first started in the industry 37 years ago, and that is you can call them wealthy, but rich people didn't, they thought mutual funds were beneath them. That was for people of lesser amounts that couldn't afford to diversify. And ETFs somewhat resonate with richer people, wealthier, whatever you want to call them, more so. So I am product ambivalent, you know, or, or neutral. I just, I don't care. I mean, if I, I pitch, here's the positioning, which one do you want? They ask me which one I want most of the time. And we put in a blend of both. Mark, it's such a powerful point because one of one of the things that we determined here a long time ago was that if we're in partnership with advisors, we want to offer our services in whatever vehicle works for the end client that the advisor is serving. And so in the very early days, actually, uh, before we even offered mutual funds, we were an institutional separate account manager with very fancy clients, big pension and endowments and uh, big uh, foundations and so on. And it was an advisor who serviced that community who came to us and said, you know, I have some clients where a mutual fund would actually be pretty helpful. They're too small to have an institutional separate account. And at the time, my father's first reaction was, well, you should go to a mutual fund <clears throat> manager. Uh, we're, we're institutional accounts. And then of course, thank God he hesitated. And he said, well, wait a minute, how is it different in terms of what we do? And here we have an advisor that we've had a deep relationship with who says it would be helpful if they could access our services through this vehicle. And that was, uh, we launched the, that was the launching of the, the mutual funds. And so in, in a way, the ETFs was an aspect of that history repeating itself, but whether it's separately managed accounts or institutional accounts or annuities, uh, 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 we want to make sure that we have our services. If, a, if an advisor wants our services, we want to make sure we have it in whatever vehicle works for the ed client. So, so Chris, when I was listening to you describe why your strategies are uniquely suited for ETFs, um, there's one that, you know, I'm not going to tease you here, but uh, I think you left out, which is high active share, right? Um, I see this all the time from advisors right now. They don't want to buy another broad-based international fund or global fund or another S&P clone. They're, they want to augment that. They want to bring in something. And, you know, that, that high active share doesn't exist in very many ETFs, especially when you get to international. I've, you know, 
I've, I know the radical transparency that you have, the, the, all those things, you know, open up the conversation. But at the end of the day, your portfolio looks like nothing else. Like when we comp it, there's nothing with even like 20% overlap. Well, I, you're absolutely right. It, it actually goes back to a very uh, old piece of common sense, which is you can't do what everybody else does and expect a different result. And uh, so, you know, we build the portfolios by the ground up, but that selectivity is really a defining characteristic. And you're right, it's especially true outside the US. I mean, outside the US, active managers have an opportunity to add so much value. And I think traditional ETF investors who had very little choice, oh, I could be an emerging markets fund, I could be in an international global, you know, what they tend to be doing is owning a huge amount of stocks with a lot of huge mediocrity in it. And the reason there's so much mediocrity, especially internationally, is because a lot of the biggest companies, when you go outside of the US, almost every major economy was socialized at some point in its history. And the result is that in almost every market, the largest companies are companies that were once state owned or state controlled. And you know, we started the conversation with Dan on the subject of culture. That is a great example of a cultural foundation that is rotten. You don't have accountability. You don't have that entrepreneurial snap. You don't have that vision of a founder and that sense of accountability and responsibility. So the largest utilities, the largest energy companies, often the largest media companies, the largest consumer products. I mean, you can go, you know, whether you're in France or Italy or whether you're in Asia, uh, it's amazing how many, or you know, South America, how many of the largest companies in the index have these really culturally, this sort of rotten foundation. So being selective globally and internationally lets us put together a portfolio that is sort of amazing because they don't look anything like the index and yet they have a higher growth rate and a lower valuation. We, we always say that's like a value investor's dream uh, where you're not paying a penalty for buying discounted assets. You're actually getting premium companies at a discounted price, but it just looks nothing like the index. So, so I wanna to go to Mark with the same kind of question. So when we look at these kinds of ETFs, you know, the, what Davis is doing with your four funds in the ETF space, we compare you to a benchmark, right? The, the broad-based basic ones. Um, and then we calculate how different you are from that. And then the difference in fee, we call that smart cost. Any, any of you out there that wanna access the ETF think tank tools to see the smart cost, it's a great way to isolate it. To, to that end, we find most of the advisors we work with use your funds as a satellite, meaning they have their broad-based beta, and then they want to augment that with a transparent, active, very high active share fund. I'm curious, Mark, is that similar to how you use it, or is there a different approach to how you look at these funds? Good question, Michael. Um, it's I was, you were, as you were asking that, I'm almost thinking through that in a lot of our portfolios that Davis and one or two others are more of a core than a satellite. Um, and in our portfolios, uh, very agnostic, we have a slice that is going to be an individually managed equity portfolio. I don't pick the stocks. Remember, I'm not the asset manager, but we have a portfolios that are individual. And we've got our core funds and then we have our satellites and we have our special situations out there. So I think that the Davis like Davis and Davis like sort of borderline uh, crossing over from core to satellite with us. That that's may, that's uh, why we love having. No, no, I love it. I love that each like each idea can have the audience in a different way. Um, you know, so it's very interesting. Um, I think, Dan, it's time to talk about something that has been, call it, let's see, is it is it a headwind or a tailwind? It's definitely a headwind, something that's been a headache for this year. So, Dan, you want to take it away? Yeah, so, Chris, um, I, I'm going to ask the question in, in maybe a little bit of a bifurcated way, uh, China, right? We recently saw um, uh, Charlie Munger. Uh, do something that was really kind of a surprise to many of us, right? Where he doubled up through an entity that, frankly, I wasn't familiar with. So talk to us a little bit about China. Um, and if you have any insights on how he did it through the entity that he did, uh, that would be great. And if you could throw a little uh, Berkshire in there, that would be 
also great because, well, you know that firm very well. Well, and and Charlie Munger has been a role model and mentor and and uh, uh, somebody that I've admired and and owe an enormous debt of gratitude to toward. So, well, how about if if how about if I start with China and work backwards to Charlie and Berkshire? And and I'll start with China by saying, look, when you're investing globally, you should start. If you're not going to look like the index, you should think of what do you want to own more of and what do you want to own less of. Now, for 40 years, China has grown as a percentage of world GDP. It's one of the most unbelievable records in financial history. Uh, whether or not you like the politics of the government, the economic policies have resulted in lifting one of the, the largest country on earth by population out of poverty into what this June, this June became the largest consumer economy on earth. It is one of the miraculous stories of a century. Now, the, uh, so in thinking as investors, we like the idea of, well, here we have a lot of data showing a very long-term economic orientation towards lifting people out of uh, poverty and advancing the economy and building wealth. So would we rather own more in China or more in Japan? Would we rather own more in China or more in Brazil? Would we rather own more in China or more in Russia? What about more in China or more in Italy? And as we think in those terms, we'd say, well, the record of building wealth, building businesses in China has been pretty extraordinary. So that should be at least a place that we want to start to look. But I will say that investing in China this year, which of course has been such a terrible year in terms of results, in terms of fear of a huge uh, a political crackdown there reminds me a lot of financial stocks during the crisis here, right? In the, in the financial crisis, there were real changes in the financial sector and not all of them were positive, right? I mean, you can look at the return on equities of certain businesses that will never recover. There were government takeovers of some businesses. Uh, uh, there was an enormous change and turmoil. And as we came out of that, there was a sort of a sense that people just didn't want to look at that financial sector for a long time. And yet there was an enormous amount of value there if you were willing to look through the awful headlines, through the volatility. And I would say investing in China this year, we've, uh, uh, we're cognizant of some of the changes in the risk landscape, but we also have enormous data that China, and I wouldn't want to take the other side of the bet that China would be, will be a larger percentage of the global economy five years and 10 years from now than it is today. Um, it would be a very, it would be hard for me to, to take that bet. So we start now within that, we wanna be highly selective. We wanna do our best to avoid the worst regulatory risk. We have not always been successful doing that, but I like the way our portfolio is positioned currently. And, uh, and so I'll start with that as sort of a background on China. Now we have, 70% of our portfolio that's not uh, involved in that. But we think that if you, if you wanted to start with an area where you're getting a lot of earnings for very little market cap, you know, John Templeton always used to say, uh, people always ask me, what looks good? You know, what, what looks good to invest? And he would say, that's the wrong question. Ask what looks bad. And then where are people afraid? And then look through there and see if you can see a rationale for investing through it. And the financial services during the financial crisis, the look through was we still think the financial services sector of our economy is gonna be relevant and profitable over a long period of time. Can we run a Geiger counter over this debris and, and, uh, and figure out where that durability and resilience is gonna manifest? And I think China is exactly like that. Now, I actually think it represents uh, a very, uh, controversial, very unsettling area, but I think it's where people should be spending time and attention. Now, Charlie. Um, so uh, Charlie has said publicly that essentially all of his net worth uh, is in three investments, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Costco, and uh, uh, with a, a fellow named Lee Liu, uh, who is a, a, a spectacular long-term investor with a deep focus on Asia in general and China in particular. 
Uh, now, Charlie's never broken out those amounts, but he's very close with Lee Lu, and, and he has said those are his three biggest investments. Now, there is a fourth investment, which is the one you allude to. He is the chairman of a tiny public company, publicly traded company called The Daily Journal. The Daily Journal is an old law uh, uh, periodical in which legal notices were printed and all the courtrooms across the country had to subscribe. And, and of course, that's a business that's under attack by the internet. And, and Charlie, as chairman, has managed this little public company in such a way that it's built up a lot of cash. And, uh, and with that cash, and this will speak to the analogy with the financial crisis, he made one of the great investments of the last 25 years, which was the Daily Journal under Charlie's leadership purchased Wells Fargo at the absolute bottom tick of the financial crisis. He was, I, I think, I mean, I've heard it said that he was the only buyer down on the floor, you know, at the booth uh, buying uh, when there was sort of no bid uh, buying for the Daily Journal. So that, of course, has built this huge value. He bought a few other financial stocks then too, but Wells Fargo was the biggest. And then here it is that he's bought Alibaba uh, and then significantly added to it right during this crisis. So it speaks to Charlie's contrarian nature. It should be clear that China is an area that he's been very vocal about for the last decade, saying that he admires the Chinese work ethic, he admires the Confucian view of respect for parents and authority, that he is a believer that the Chinese policies and economic policies have been rational and long-term and pragmatic, and uh, that he wouldn't want to bet against them. And, uh, and so he's been very vocal about his views in China. I think uh, the Daily Journal investment is not going to be large relative to Charlie Munger's net worth, but I do think it speaks to uh, a mindset that we certainly share and admire. And, and certainly we have been uh, buyers of China in this very uh, complicated period. But, but he well, and so Warren they, don't, don't always agree though, right? But, well, that's a good example. So it, it, uh, I think Charlie was asked at the Daily Journal hosts an annual meeting, just like Berkshire, uh, that Charlie presides over. And he was asked in that meeting about the fact that Berkshire had sold a lot of its bank stocks and, <laughs> and uh, in Wells in particular, and that uh, the Daily Journal hadn't. And, and Charlie said, well, we, we don't always agree on everything. And that's one where I'm a lot more tolerant about the foibles of bankers, I think was his phrase or something along those lines. Um, so they don't, they don't always agree, but it's, I would say that Warren and Charlie is one of the greatest partnerships, one that should be studied and admired by all. And by the way, having a successful partnership, it's nice for somebody who is the, the number two partner, you're right, in Berkshire Hathaway, if the votes are one to one, Warren wins. Uh, it's nice in that, I think, for Charlie to be able to have a little minor way to express uh, a slightly different point of view. And, and, uh, and so that, that may be an example of that and something that's helped their partnership over the years. All right. So, Mark, uh, let's go to you on this. Let's get the, the client perspective on China, right? Um, we've talked a little bit about Davis and their high active share, and we've, you know, uh, Chris has humbly acknowledged that China's been a little bit tough this year, but not something he wants to bet against. How does that work for you with explaining it to clients between Davis one year where they're way outperforming and the next year they may be underperforming? How do you communicate that with clients? Michael, I, I think about a couple things with China um, and maybe they don't have the most sophisticated advisor and maybe I don't have the most sophisticated clientele. I think they're pretty smart and I'm lucky to have them as clients. If you ask them in a multiple choice question a year ago to identify the largest real estate holding company in China and Evergrande was one of three answers, I would bet you that the passing grade would be, you know, the 50% maybe. Nobody ever heard of Evergrande, okay? Again, it could be my clientele. I'm in the Midwest, perhaps in major metropolitan cities, it's different. Perhaps if you focus in real estate, it's different. But Evergrande is now the headline and uh, 
you know, our determination uh, from smart people that I read with, you know, with, within our strategy group is it's not a Lehman moment. Um, you know, liabilities are smaller compared to Lehman. Uh, it, this too shall pass. And China is part of our world. I think of back, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I've seen Chris on more than one occasion in a conference. I saw someone who has a role like Chris. I won't, I'll describe him and you all will laugh very quickly. He's not very tall. He always wore bow ties. Uh, and he's been around a long time and he made a very passionate speech at a conference, I'm telling you, 25, 30 years ago, that he was going to take his six-year-old daughter and teach her how to speak Chinese because China was going to rule the world by 2020. So this is a conference back in the 90s. China certainly is, you know, the 800-pound the gorilla in the room, room. I think I've done pretty well by having more assets here in the United States than there. It's a player, it's a part of our world, but Michael, it's not a topic of conversation. Our conversations are more, well, they're just more local than, than global. And along those lines, Mark, um, how do you handle the question um, with your clients regarding value versus growth? So, <laughs> you know, um, they're, they're always, both going to be in our portfolio. I think it's, again, a fool's game to guess which one or the other. Um, Chris, I'll make sure I got the years right. They all run together as we get in the business longer. But it seemed like growth, S&P growth, S&P value, neck and neck, neck and neck. And it was in 2019 that there was that huge differential, of like 30% versus 3%. Was that the year I'm thinking? Yes, yeah. And it, and it, it just sort of went hyperbolic. Right. And I told Chris this, this story, it seems like whenever I get him on a client call, I always re remind him that I was at a conference, Chris is on stage there, and it's a Barron's conference, so there's advisors from every firm, and he looks at us, and he says, I've, I've got not doing uh, him, he didn't say these exact words, but he basically told us we're all stupid, because we sell him when we should be buying him, and we buy him when we should be selling him. Buying a value strategy in 2019 would have been the equivalent of buying Wells Fargo at the bottom, at, at the magical moment there. And so to answer your question in a very roundabout fashion, we always have both. You know, we were lucky enough, perhaps organically, to have more of a bias towards growth than value in 2000, coming into 19, just because growth had either neck and neck or done a little bit better. But lo and behold, we were rewarded, you know, in 2020 and now owning value. So we are not the advisor that bets on red or black. It's going to have both chips on the table with a little bit of an imbalance one direction or the other. All right. So let's let's go back to Chris, because we really talked a lot about, you know, the structuring. We've talked a lot about uh, the opportunities. We've talked about the things that have happened this year. I want to talk about what you see going forward, Chris. Like, what's your, what's your outlook? What gets you excited? What, what places are your deep research team really getting into for the next five, ten years? Right. Well, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it always starts with this word dispersion. You know, as investors, we love to see when there are big gaps have opened up between. Uh, the perception or the valuation of one part of the economy or one part of the market or one part of the world versus the rest, going back to that Templeton quote. So Mark is exactly right. Uh, 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 by the way, I also agree that he's right that I, I would rather have more of my assets in the US than China. Uh, so, and, and that would be true in all of our, our strategies, but it's, it's just looking at, you know, that part of the portfolio where there's controversy, where there's headline risk, where the attention is focused. I mean, this is why we love having partnership with advisors, because when you were buying, you know, Wells Fargo or Bank of America uh, during the financial crisis, it was amazing, the visceral hostility of clients, you know, you just, don't you read the papers? I mean, look at what these, these uh, uh, terrible institutions have done to our country. And, and, and of course, you know, investing in China today has elements of that too. It, it's sort of a sense that it's sort of unpatriotic. And so, you know, we always start with we're patriots first, we, we love our country. And, and we also think about, you know, over the course of all of the opportunities that we look at, how do we look at, at, at 
buying value, you know, buying good companies at a, at a cheap price. And it's usually when you get this visceral reaction. Uh, that's a good place to start looking. So let's talk about dispersion. So, you know, Mark hit it hard. The value growth dispersion had been getting wider and wider over the last three, four, five uh, years. And then it, it sort of blew out. So by August uh, 31st, so call it the beginning of September this year, uh, the, the value index over five years had compounded at 12% and the growth index at 23%. That was the widest five-year gap, I think, I've, I've, certainly that I've ever seen. Uh, and so that to us was very compelling in terms of looking through at where there could be real opportunities. Now, this is where it gets dangerous. And for ETF investors in particular, I think they hear something like that and they think, well, I should buy a value index then. And I would say, in uh, uh, other times when growth is underperformed, I should buy a growth index. I would say if you're investing sort of through the cycles, if you're investing over the long term, the key is to look beyond those labels. And what I mean by that is within the value category, we see two totally different types of companies. One are what we would call uh, companies that have durable growing value, like value that can grow uh, over time. So think of companies like you know, some of the financials we've talked about, you know, Bank of New York, American Express, but also think about Intel, Applied Materials, uh, uh, Raytheon, uh, uh, Berkshire. I mean, these are companies that are, quote, value companies, but have produced long records of durable growth. And so I think when people think of value being out of favor, they think, oh, I should buy some you know, piece of crap cyclical company that, you know, is teetering on bankruptcy, but comes into favor if there's a cyclical upturn, but God help you if something goes wrong in the economy or in the sector. So we think trying to be smart twice, when to buy, when to sell is a tough way to make a money. So within the value category, which we think is cheap as a whole, there's a particular area to focus in. And similarly on the growth side, you know, as, as people rotate out of growth, there's two different types of growth. There's this speculative, insane, what I think of as really bubble stocks. You know, uh, uh, I recently reread a wonderful quote by uh, Scott, uh, 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 Scott McNeely uh, uh, from Sun Micro back in the day. In 2002, he gave an interview and he said, you know, what were people thinking buying our stock at 10 times revenue? Like for them to get their money back over the next decade, we would have had to pay out 100% of revenue, had no cost of goods sold, no taxes, no, you know, uh, 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 you know, it was, he said, what were you thinking? Uh, so when we think about, I mean, I'll give you a real life example, Tesla, Square, Spotify, Zoom, Shopify, those five companies currently have a market cap of 1.3 trillion, right? For the same 1.3 trillion, uh, you could buy, I'm going to do this from memory, So, you, but I think JP Morgan, American Express, Bank of New York, Capital One, uh, uh, Applied Materials, Intel, and Raytheon. I think I've got that right. I may have to fact check me on it, but th this is what, I, what I'll call roughly right. Uh, or direct, that Those companies that I just mentioned, sort of core of our, a lot of our portfolios, 1.3 trillion market cap. So same price. That first group of companies is currently generating about $9 billion uh, of profit. So call it a 0.8% or so, 0.7% earnings yield. The second group of companies is generating uh, collective profits of about 90 billion, 10 times as much. Now, here's the rub. Those first companies are growing so fast. Imagine that that first group of the, these speculative bubble stocks grows as fast in the next decade as Apple, Amazon, and Google grew in the last decade. That's pretty good, right? So give them the benefit of the gap. They're, they'll grow as fast as Google, Amazon, and Apple grew in the last 10 years. They'll grow that fast in the next 10 years. Then imagine that they go from the very low profit margins they have today to having profit margins as high as Google, right? The highest in that group, right? If you play that out over 10 years, now take our group of companies and say, instead, they only grow 5% you know, around half of what they grew in the last 10 years in terms of profits. Play that out over 10 years. After 10 years, our group of companies has generated in earnings the entire market cap, 1.3 trillion, and is still earning more annually 
than the speculative bubble companies, <clears throat> even with those assumptions. And those speculative bubble companies have cumulatively would have earned half as much, but even annually would still be earning less. So within the growth sector, there's this speculative, dangerous bubble stocks with a huge amount built in, but there's also Google, right? Facebook. I mean, you know, these companies are trading in many cases at a discount to the market a couple of years out. So within growth, look for the blue chips, look for the durable growth, uh, not the, the go-go high flyers, but the ones that can be compounding machines. So we think of undervalued growth or value that can grow as those are the real opportunities for the portfolio today. So, so Mark, coming to you about um, financials, okay, I, I, I think Chris's definition of what a financial may be different than what your clients are thinking about what a financial company is. You know, how do you handle that perhaps? Because Chris talks about Berkshire Hathaway and insurance companies as being financials. Do you, do you have to communicate to your clients um, what the opportunity is in regards to what a financial service company is? To a point, absolutely, because they hear financials and they think about JP Morgan, Bank of America, you know, the names Wells Fargo that Chris was speaking to. They don't necessarily think about Ameriprise, Goldman, um, Visa, others. It's banks that they think about um, in, in, in regards to financials. And you do have to take it a little bit of deeper of a conversation when they think about, but gee, if rates are so compressed right now, banks don't make any money. And my counter would be, well, when rates go up, spreads widen and not as compressed, they borrow at X and then they're able to lend it out at you know X plus X plus X, pretty good deal for the banks there. But I, to get them to think beyond that, um, it's not a challenge. It's just a little extra effort. And they think too much about just US banks and Chris's definition is very global. Yeah, I mean, to, to there are no banks outside the U.S. According to our clients, they definitely think U.S. banks. <laughs> Although yeah. I will say, if you're going to own a bank outside the U.S., we always think you 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 want to be very careful about that economy and that currency. Again, going back to the state-owned comments I made earlier, but so we own very we're very selective in owning banks outside the U.S. I don't own any French banks or German <laughs> banks or Italian banks, but I don't mind owning you know the the largest bank in Norway largest bank in Denmark, the largest bank in Singapore, uh, one of the largest banks in Bermuda, uh, high quality Swiss bank. Uh, Thanks, you know, Chris. those- I was gonna ask you, what about a Swiss bank? <laughs> <laughs> so far, I've only owned the ones that are very narrowly focused. Uh, but, uh, but I have to say, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, 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 you know, UBS is one of the true uh, 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 global financials. There aren't really many. I mean, you couldn't say that about J.P. Morgan. Uh, it, J.P. Morgan is a wonderful company, but you wouldn't really think of it as, as a global uh, uh, company in the same way that UBS has really been a global company for, for generations. And, and that's part of the, the mindset and the ethos of that place. Chris, just um, as we wrap up, where should people go to learn more about Davis and Davis funds and all the research that you folks have out there? Well, I, I think we have a, a good website. Of course, I'm biased, uh, but you know, we try to, as part of our culture, put out a lot of things that will be of interest to advisors, whether or not they're our clients. Uh, we just want to have information out there about behavior, about you know the the behavioral economics piece, but also uh, about where we see opportunities. We like that culture of transparency and 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 you know, that, that building a relationship over a long time. So I hope you'll, you'll come just to, to look at the resources and the materials that they are there. They are not very promotional, but they're very information rich. And I hope that'll be helpful. Wonderful. And Mr. Schweito, we always like to end on a high note by highlighting a charity. We always ask our advisor to bring one. So Mark, uh, what's the charity you would like our audience to learn about today and to hopefully uh, donate to? Well, thank, thanks for that opportunity. And, and it's funny, when I submitted this name, I, I do sit on a board of a, of a foundation that uh, has over $300 million of which we give away. We, it's beautiful because we don't ever solicit or really even take any uh, contributions or donations. It's the most fun board I've ever sat on because all you do is give money away. 
So I think if that executive director hears me talk about this and I say, why didn't you talk about the one you sit on? Um, I, I chose to pick a really like a, the, the micro cap of micro cap charities. And it's right here in hometown. I stumbled upon it uh, a mere six months ago. It's called the Delta Center. And the Delta Center is for troubled kids. Um, and they do something really perhaps others do, but they've got this magnet in this, this neighborhood there. And the magnet being an amazing gymnasium that has been funded by a family that uh, I would make uh, the analogy that they've taken in one of the kids like the blind side story. And so they've given a, a, a terrific amount of money, tremendous amount of money to this. But what they do is they bring kids in and upstairs in the gymnasium, they have different classrooms. And these kids come in and they're in pods, maybe a five a piece, and they have provided them with laptops that they have to do their homework and they're supervised by the very low paid workers there before they can go down in the gym and do their practicing in the sort. Um, so it's, it's a magnet of, of like a lot of neighborhoods. It's, you know, particularly in basketball world where I live, it's a gymnasium, um, but it's both boys and girls. Uh, and, they, and, they, and they are not allowed to do their love before they do what they have to do. Um, and, and frankly, it's just very unique in that regard to, from what I've seen anywhere in my community and then the self-promotional is that we reached out, this is for them more than what we did, but we said we'd like to try and feed um, families. And everybody who goes out at Thanksgiving and Christmas and gives away turkeys, or our idea was Memorial Day is a kickoff to summers in the parks, families. So we did, uh, with the help of a, of a local food provider, gave away uh, steak dinners to over 500 families for Memorial Day at the Delta Center that they got the word out in the community and it was lined up for blocks for people coming for the food giveaway uh, because of what they, their network is and what they do for the community. So the Delta Center of Louisville, Kentucky. And fr frankly, if you look it up on GodStar, you're gonna see these guys are broke. They don't have any money. That's true, uh, but they will use the money wisely if given, if, if they receive it. Well, thank you everybody. Um... We appreciate the time. We appreciate the discussion. The insights have great value to um, everybody who listened. Um, have a great day. And um, thanks, being, thanks for being a part of the ETF Think Tank. The views and opinions expressed during this event are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the sponsor or organizer. Information set forth during this event has been obtained or derived from sources believed by the participants to be reliable. However, neither the sponsor nor the organizer make any representation or warranty, express or implied, as to the information's accuracy or completeness, nor does the sponsor or organizer recommend that the information shared during this event serve as the basis of any investment decision, and it has been provided to you solely for informational purposes only, and does not constitute an offer or solicitation of an offer or any advice or recommendation to purchase any securities or other financial instruments and may not be construed as such. Past performance does not guarantee future results. This interview is being distributed for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment product. It does not constitute legal or tax advice. The information provided is not intended as a complete analysis of every material fact, and the underlying assumptions and views are subject to change based on market and other conditions. All investments involve risks, including possible loss of principal.